You always get that question. Well, weren't these camps for hardcore Nazis? And my answer is always the same. Yeah, there were a few, but they were by and large, a very small minority, and they didn't represent the character, the so-called threat that all the other alien enemy internees might have presented. But that distortion persists. People wonder because they see pictures that, well, there were Nazis in camp. I've talked to many Japanese who don't know at all that there were 5,000 people at Thule Lake who renounced their citizenship because they were so bitter and wanted to go back to Japan. But those stories and those characterizations hardly represent the great majority of people who were interned and wound up behind barbed wire. Fritz Kuhn. I know about him because my parents talked about him and the fact that my dad accompanied him to New York to put him on a plane for Germany. I didn't know very much about the inside, I can't say, except that I always understood that the people that were in there had been found guilty of crimes against the United States government. That's all, that, that's all that I knew. Everybody felt that they were innocent and the other people were guilty. But it's just to show you what happens when you're locked up. If you talk to uh, an internee, he'll tell you that being imprisoned, being behind barbed wire, no matter how well they fed us, how warm they kept the barracks, and how much recreation they provided us, it was still prison. And the Germans had a term for it called Gitter Krankheit, the fence sickness. And it meant that if you are behind barbed wire for so long, you begin to feel like a prisoner, even though you know you've done nothing wrong. I did see my mother suffering a lot there. It was hard on the women, I think. It was very hard. It was back to a very primitive lifestyle. We had community showers and community toilets, and it was hot and buggy and miserable. I, I don't know, I'm trying, I never saw my mother happy there. We as kids, you know, we were with our folks, we kind of rolled with the punches that pool. That was the most wonderful thing in that whole camp. They had just finished it before we were placed in the camp and it was opened and that was where I loved spending time. And you heard the story about the two Japanese little girls drowning there and then it was promptly closed up again. And we always heard the stories about snakes in there too. I hung out with a group like Ed Four and those guys. But 90% of the time we were in a, in a swimming pool. What else was there to do? Somebody had a, a regular accordion down there, and I got a hold of that thing to start butting with it. My nickname is Gunt. Gunt, bring a squeeze box along, you know. You could play anything, just so it was music. They didn't care what it was as long as it was music. So I don't know how good or how bad or whatever, but I do have memories of it. And one shape or another, but you know, I'm not sure they're mine or they're talked about, you know what I mean, it's all kind of. We rented current movies, the story of Irene and Vernon Castle, but unfortunately that movie was about World War I and the censors cut out a lot of that movie. It was really strange to see these young Japanese men coming to visit their parents. Uh, you know, with their uniform. It touched me that this would happen to anybody. They were tar paper shacks. My mom just went, Ugh. So my dad said, I'll fix it up. So he, he fixed it up, so he painted the wall. And so we survived that too. We used uh, public latrines and we ate in a mess hall where my father was a baker and, and, and probably a cook too. My, my folks had access to whatever little money they had. He had an insurance policy. He had savings bonds. 
uh, you know, called war bonds at that time. The camp was pleasant, you know. I mean, from my perspective, a child's perspective, you, you didn't know you were behind a fence. And I went to German school, learned that we were going to go to Germany, and so my father thought we ought to learn to speak German. I learned my German, and I went to Germany. A year and a half after my father had first been arrested, which was in mid-1942, he finally had a hearing. It was the first time he'd had a hearing that even looked at the question of his innocence or guilt. It was the first time he had ever heard any of the charges against him. After the hearing, they really decided that he really he wasn't dangerous. He didn't really need to be in the camp, and he was allowed to leave. That's why I was asking you who is saying that there were so many people that never had a trial or never had anything and were just put in there without... I mean, I'm curious about that. I'd really like to know who has proved that. I, you know, I mean, just because uh, if that was the case, I, I, I think that's very sad. In October of 44, there was an exchange voyage where we exchanged uh, internees that were here, German-American internees, for Americans that were overseas. So my theory is that when that happened, they needed more bodies, more exchange bait. And that's why my father was arrested. He had a family of four. Well, that gives them four. Now we can, we can exchange for four more people. Back from her fourth wartime journey of mercy, the Swedish exchange ship Gripsholm arrives in New York Harbor. Aboard are 663 Americans, home from Nazi internment and prison camps. Wounded soldiers, war correspondents, and diplomats are among her passenger list. We're very glad to get home. We've been 13 months interned in Germany, and 13 bad months for the Germans as well as for ourselves, because in those 13 months, Germany has lost the war. They know they're whipped, but they're wondering how they're going to get out of it. My father was uh, asked whether he would agree to go to Germany. He didn't know when he was going to get out of camp, because they didn't give, you, you didn't violate any law, and the only way he could get out was to agree to be shipped to Germany. We were on the last ship. The government made four trips to Japan and four trips to Germany, and they altered them. One went to Japan, one went to Germany, one went to Japan. The U.S. didn't have enough Japanese prisoners to exchange. Japan had lots of American prisoners, you know, people who were stranded there, and it, it wasn't an even exchange. So in 1943, the government made, wanted to make sure they had enough hostages. That's when they collaborated with the Peruvian government to kidnap 2,000 Japanese Peruvians to use in the prisoner of war exchange. President Truman issued an order that says all those that are interned will be deported. So my father, rather than being deported, decided to repatriate. You know, if you're deported, it's a, it's a bad mark on your record at two locations, the location you're coming from and the location you're going to, because usually you deport people who violated the law or something. So my father decided to repatriate. So in December 45, we leave Crystal City, 101 of us, and go to Ellis Island on a train. They took us to Beritz, France, where we were handed over to the German Wehrmacht because France was now under the occupation of the Germans. And everybody was sad or freaked out or morose or, as I say, it was a totally gray society, totally different from the German society that we were a part of in New York. I mean, we were happy people. And here we are now in Germany and getting ready to survive the war. All our trunks were just stolen. Like I say, all we arrived with was the, with the suitcases we carried. That's all we had. And we lived with my grandmother in a two-room apartment. I used to love to go greet my American buddies. I'd hear planes and I'd run outside and wave at my American buddies. And one time I'm waving and I see this bomb coming out of a plane. 
course, I did know better, and I ran, and I just made the threshold of the house when this bomb hit. Some of the civilians in town did get killed in that instance, and my guardian angel saved me. So uh, that was my experience with waving at my American buddies. And every time there was an air raid, uh, we used to, they used to, everybody downstairs to the vault, and they used to, about three guys used to hold the door, make sure they didn't lock until it was safe to go up again. We moved around and we used to hide in the, in the, in the black forest too, because they didn't, they wouldn't bomb there. Uh, we were virtually starving. The U.S. Army came into the town we were living in. We ran down to where the uh, U.S. troops were having dinner. One said, uh, to came around, he said, get out of here, you little assholes. So I responded and said, who are you calling asshole? And the whole line turned around. How come I speak such perfect English? He said, do you have a sister? I said, yeah. Is her name Ingrid? I said, yes. He said, uh, I was going with her. <laughs> so it was uh, fortuitous because we had no food. He was the chef of the regiment.